Je vous remercie de m'avoir invité de tourner cet exposé, exposé ici euh, au colloque des sciences mathématiques du Québec. C'est un grand honneur pour moi. Euh, cette semaine, c'est la semaine de relâche à Toronto et je suis content que ça m'ait permis de rendre visite à mes collègues québécois et québécoises. Merci. OK, so yeah, as you can tell, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, rigid local systems. And um, my ambitious plan for this talk is that uh, at least half of it, maybe more, uh, maybe everything, should be accessible to everyone. Um, so my apologies to the expert. I want to start really with um, you know, an elementary overview kind of, uh, of the basics of topology that's going to be needed to understand what a rigid local system is. There will be some new results uh, as well. Let's see if this works. Uh, no, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, and so the, the new results, uh, so three of the four papers I'm going to mention are uh, joint work with uh, Elene No from the Free University of Berlin. And the fourth paper is uh, joint work with uh, Eno and uh, Yuan de Jong uh, from uh, Columbia, New York. Okay, so let's start with uh, the overview part of topology required to understand uh, what a rigid local system is and what the, the main expectations are that we have concerning them. So this is quickly what I explain to uh, what I intend to explain. Just give an overview of uh, cohomology focusing on the two types of cohomology theory that are the most important uh, for today's talk, uh, Betty cohomology and Turan cohomology, and then explain how everything relates uh, to the theory of local systems, and in particular towards the end, uh, the topology of algebraic varieties. Okay, let's talk about uh, simplicial homology. So usually when studying spaces, uh, the idea is to extract a nice uh, manageable invariance that tell us something about uh, the topological or geometric properties of these spaces. And one very classical approach of doing this is to triangulate the space. So to kind of assume that you can decompose it into nice building blocks, uh, simplices, just like you can see here for the two sphere, picture on the left. So this is a sort of a discretized version of X, uh, which allows us uh, to further uh, form I-dimensional uh, shapes inside of the space, which we can use to probe uh, the geometry of X. And so the formal definition is we're going to look at uh, I chains. So an I chain is simply an integral combination of I simplices. So these building, block, building blocks, which are I dimensional, and the resulting free abelian group of I chains will be denoted by CI of X. So here in this picture, you can already see a, a one chain on a two sphere, and you can see a two chain on a two sphere as well on the right. So those are the, the kind of the one and two dimensional shapes that can be used to to probe, of, to probe the geometry of the two-sphere and more complicated spaces as well. And so these abelian groups of chains uh, come with a linear map uh, called the boundary map or the boundary operator, um, which does pretty much what you expect it to do. So it associates the chain like this two chain here, its boundary. And as the boundary, we really want to obtain this uh, contour Around the chain, chain. Do you see that something is happening in here because the bit in the middle appears here twice, twice, and you can only the boundary of it. Once the time is and minus the minus, like the is bonding to these kind of opposite orientations meeting when you're computing the boundary. And so now, uh, having this notion of the boundary, we can introduce uh, cycles. Those are simply chains uh, with zero boundary. So elements of the kernel. And the simple geometric observation that the boundary of a boundary is always a closed shape. So in other words, applying the boundary operator twice, we obtain the zero operator. <coughs> that implies that this definition of the homology uh, group is well-defined and makes sense. Simply the quotient of cycles by boundaries. So the quotient of the kernel of the boundary operator by its image. So this is the degree I homology space, and it measures to what extent a cycle is a boundary. So for instance, uh, in the example of the two sphere, it is clear that every one dimensional cycle, which is sort of a loop, will bound a two dimensional region. So it's quite easy to find a two chain, which is bounded by a given one cycle. And so thus you've convinced yourself that H1 of the two sphere is zero. On the other hand, if you look at the degree two homology, and you can take this very canonical cycle where you just take the linear combination of all the two simplices, of all the triangles, 
with the same multiplicity. So this is also known as the fundamental class of the, the two sphere, and it, it generates uh, the second uh, homology group. So this leads uh, essentially the summary of what I just said is this computation of the homology of this triangulated two sphere. So now what we're actually going to see today is cohomology of the space, which is essentially just uh, the dual perspective on homology. So here we're looking at uh, the dual group of the space of chains, so just homomorphisms from CI of X to Z. And we denote this essentially by <laughs> the same notation, but just using a superscript rather than a, a subscript. And one picture that I want to kind of advertise is that this is a sort of discretized version of, of integration theory, if you want. Because almost by definition, what a cochain does, it's associating to every I chain a number, an integer. And I can think, I can just denote this number as a kind of a formal integral of uh, the cochain over this uh, I chain. So now uh, this leads to a, a beautiful formula because if I define the co boundary operator to be the dual of the boundary operator, then this definition can be expressed in terms of the, the discrete Stokes formula, telling me that if I integrate uh, the co boundary of a co cycle over a chain, this is the same thing as integrating. Uh, the co-cycle or the co-chain over the boundary of the, the chain. So the integral of d phi over c equals the integral of phi over the boundary of the c. And this is some kind of discrete analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus, for instance, or the, the Stokes formula. Right, and so now uh, the cohomology group in degree i is defined to be the quotient of the kernel of the co-boundary operator. So this kernel is also known as the, the space of co-cycles by uh, co-boundaries. So it's again, a very similar definition to the one of homology, but it turns out to be just a, a dual perspective kind of measuring the same geometrical topological properties of our space. So this is something that is probably best emphasized by taking a look at this example. So you see that the ranks of the cohomology groups of a two sphere really agree with the ranks of the homology group of the two sphere. And indeed, if you're happy to ignore torsion phenomena, if you're happy to ignore torsion groups, then the cohomology is really just a dual of homology. So now, what about the Ram cohomology? So let's assume uh, that our space X is no longer, no longer triangulated, but is actually a smooth manifold. So we are smoothing out uh, the corners and edges, if you want. And then uh, we have the, the theory of uh, differential forms provided by analysis. And I would assume that we're all familiar with differential forms in this room. Essentially, it's just a ready to use integrand uh, that can be integrated on an I-dimensional subspace, no further assembly required. So for instance, uh, this would be a perfectly well-defined two form. You see you have some function times dx1 wedge dx3. This symbol indicates that orientation is taken into account and so on, and you can just integrate this over every sufficiently nice bounded surface in R3. Kind of similar to, yeah, vector calculus we see as undergrads. And yeah, just as a quick remark, uh, a zero form is simply defined to be a function. So this means we can integrate zero forms on points, which simply means we are extracting the value of the function at this point. And so now um, for this uh, smooth manifold X, uh, we get this infinite dimensional space of I forms, omega I of X, and it comes with its uh, differential, which is again some kind of co-boundary operator going from degree I forms to degree I plus one forms. And it satisfies uh, the actual classical Stokes formula. So the integral over any I simplex or any chain embedded into our manifold X of D omega is equal to the integral of omega of the boundary of C. And this again is really just a, a higher dimensional generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus that we see here in yeah, introductory calculus classes. And in particular, you could actually take this identity and uh, look at what it means over smaller and smaller simplices, so kind of a smaller and smaller mesh in your manifold, and you'd obtain an actual precise formula for what this operator uh, d omega does. And so for a zero form, probably unsurprisingly, we obtain that it's really just given by the partial derivatives organized in a, in a neat way as a, a possible integral 
integrant to be integrated on a, on a path. So the definition of the RAM cohomology is again given by the quotient of the kernel of this operator by the image of the operator. So we're taking the quotient of the space of closed forms by exact forms. Again, this is something interesting to measure because every exact form happens to be closed. And uh, sometimes it's good to understand to what extent uh, the converse is true. And so the RAM cohomology defined in this way is a purely analytical definition. And so it's somehow surprising that at the end of the day, the resulting object only depends on the topology of our space. So that's precisely uh, the content of the RAM's theorem, which tells us that there is a canonical isomorphism of the RAM cohomology as I just defined it in this formula. And the real vector space associated to degree i cohomology that can be computed uh, using uh, a triangulation of the manifold x. And you know the word canonical is probably a little overused in mathematics, but I think here it's really justified because this, this is really the kind of the most natural map one could come up with. It simply takes an i from omega and associates to it the cochain phi which takes an I chain and integrates the I forms over it. So it's really a very natural map. And so this is what shows up in uh, that proof of uh, the Ram sphere. They're also in the, in the statement. All right, so now uh, let's talk about local systems, uh, which will bring us one step closer to understanding what a, a rigid local system is. And in fact, we're going to see that all these homology theories that we've just seen and all the others as well come with their own uh, notion of their own theory of local system attached. And so in the case of Betty cohomology, in the case of uh, simplicial uh, cohomology, the notion of local system is given by representations of the fundamental group. Let me quickly recall what this means. So this is a sort of non-abelian group that we associate to a space. And uh, for this purpose, we're going to fix a base point and consider closed paths starting and ending at this point X. And so these paths could be very pathological. They just have to be continuous, but they can certainly self-intersect and it's even allowed for them to be space filling, or it's not necessary. They're not necessarily needed for the definition, but they, a priori, it's a, they could be space filling as long as they're continuous. And then we're going to identify um, two such paths if they can be continuously deformed into one another just like shown in this uh, picture here. And the resulting set uh, forms the underlying set of the fundamental group. So it's really just a set of homotopy classes of closed paths on X. And the group structure is given by concatenation of paths. So just kind of walk through one path first and then walk through the other path. So concatenation provides us with the group operation on the fundamental group. And it's uh, a common theme in, in mathematics when you know dealing with complicated groups that they're studied rather in indirectly so rather than trying to understand the, the group itself and all the objects or, or all the elements or something like this the goal is usually to understand kind of the shadows this group is casting on other mathematical objects so for instance we're studying linear representations or actions of these groups on other objects like for instance trees or buildings or something like this and so in, in this talk, we're going to take the, the point of view that uh, it's natural to study linear representations of groups. And indeed, um, that's the definition of one of the main objects uh, that we need for today. A Betty local system is simply a complex linear representation of the fundamental group of X. So this is what we mean by a local system on X. And if you are inclined to do so, there's also a less elementary definition, which goes via uh, uh, sheaf theory, so using uh, locally constant sheaves of complex vector spaces. So this gives you an equivalent notion of uh, Betty local systems. But I think this elementary point of view in terms of representations is actually uh, the best one to use. There's also a uh, Duram analog of local systems. A Doram local system is simply given by a vector bundle with a flat connection. So here we're again uh, in the setting of a smooth manifold. And to define a Doram local system, first of all, we need a vector bundle. So this will be a 
a smoothly varying family of vector spaces attached to the points of X. And then uh, a section of this vector bundle is a sort of a, a generalized uh, function, which in local coordinates, you can of course really express in terms of functions, vector valid functions. And uh, so now the additional data is given by the connection, which essentially allows us to identify the fibers of this vector bundle uh, for, for different points, given the additional datum of a path, a smooth path connecting them. So in precise terms, a, a, a flag connection would be given in terms of a sort of directional derivatives satisfying certain axioms. But the only thing we need to know is that at the end of the day, for each path between two points, we can analyze morphism given by parallel transport, given by solving an explicit ODE. And flatness of the connection uh, implies that this isomorphism uh, induced by a path only depends on the homotopy and the homotopy to class. So this is the linear ODE that you have to solve in order to define a parallel transport. So it kind of exists in the uniqueness of solutions is, is needed here. here to show that it really gives an isomorphism between the different fibers. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is that we can, we can turn an analog system into a vector vector system. That is, that is, it's a way to make a page of page of the connection. But this is really what's happening. So you see the theory of focus systems is really some sort of abstract setting where you have a notion of parallel transport along a closed path, depending only on the, on the homotopy class. And so the same thing could also be done in a complex uh, holomorphic setting, which is actually going to be relevant in uh, the second half of this talk. And everything that I said in the last couple of slides also holds in this context in the complex holomorphic setting. And so one of the theorems that we're also going to use a lot implicitly today is the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence, which tells us that we can go back and forth between the Durham and the Betty picture. Just like simplicial cohomology uh, turned out to be isomorphic to the RAM cohomology, one can show that every Betty local system arises as the monodromy representation of a holomorphic smooth flat connection, depending on whether your, your manifold is just smooth or actually has a conflict. And so one important source of local systems uh, is given by, by flat connections, of course, uh, but there's another one, namely uh, vibrations of spaces over X. So I would also call those families of spaces living over X. So let's consider such a vibration. So this will be given by a sufficiently nice map F Y over X with the, in particular, the property uh, that all the fibers have to be abstractly homeomorphic to one another. So abstractly homeomorphic to the same space. But uh, so locally, this will be the case that uh, globally, of course, the vibration can be sort of twisted. So I tried to illustrate this with this picture here showing that all the fibers look the same, but as you walk around the, this kind of missing piece in the middle, so there's some, a sort of monogamy happening, you, yeah, the fibers are slightly turning. And, yeah. and um, so there's also a Durham analog of this, uh, which is given by the, the so-called Gauss-Mannin connection. So if all the spaces in this picture uh, were manifolds, then we could also look at the, the RAM cohomology of a fiber and kind of associate a, a nice flat connection. So it's called the, the Gauss-Mannin connection. And so yeah, this is quickly a summary of what I just told you. So um, the various cohomology theories, so so far we've seen the first two and the rest will make an appearance later. So there's simplicial or Betty cohomology and there's the RAM cohomology and so both have their own associate notion of local systems. In the case uh, of Betty cohomology, local systems are given by representations of the fundamental group. And in the Durand case, uh, we work with uh, flag connections. And these flag connections could be smooth, holomorphic, or even algebraic. If you're working with uh, a space defined by polynomial equations, it might be more convenient to work with flag connections that are defined uh, in terms of algebraic data. And then some other cohomology theories that are important in this area are given by Dolbo cohomology. The corresponding theory of local systems are being uh, Higgs bundles. And then in a purely algebraic or maybe even arithmetic setting, we also have uh, etal eladic cohomology with uh, lis eladic sheaves. And we have uh, crystalline cohomology uh, with the corresponding local systems being 
isocrystals or maybe even uh, F isocrystals. So they will make an appearance at the end of uh, this talk. And so the very last thing I want to say about topology is that the, the question that or the questions that I found very in interesting are usually related to understanding what kind of limitations of topological phenomena are uh, imposed by uh, algebraic conditions. So let's say that we're working with spaces cut out by finitely many polynomial equations, so-called algebraic varieties, what kind of topologies uh, or topological phenomena are possible? And so usually the most convenient uh, setting would be to pass from the world of affine varieties uh, to projective varieties, because then we're working with uh, nice and compact spaces. So they are defined by finite systems of homogeneous equations inside of projective space. And then we usually also restrict our attention to smooth varieties. So we kind of want to avoid uh, singularities in our algebraic varieties. So then there are a bunch of natural questions that can be posed and, and have been posed famously. So the first one is vaguely related to the Hotscher conjecture. So for instance, you could ask which elements of cohomology, so which co-cycles are actually induced by algebraic sub-varieties of a given algebraic variety. So is the entire cohomology group controlled by algebraic geometry itself? So that's an important and very deep question. Uh, question two, which groups can potentially arise as fundamental groups of smooth projective varieties? Are there any limitations? And this is also something that we're going to see today that there are really uh, significant qualitative uh, differences between fundamental groups of smooth projective varieties and uh, abstract finitely generated groups or finitely presented groups. And then question three is a sort of non-abelian analog of question one, if you want. Uh, namely, the question is about which local systems on a given algebraic variety stem from the variation of cohomology of an algebraic family of smooth projective and varieties over X. So we've just seen a couple of slides ago that given a vibration over X, we can associate with a local system. So now the question is, which local systems arise in this way and come from a family, an algebraic family of smooth projective varieties. And so this is yeah, related to, to Simpson's conjectures. In fact, Carlos Simpson has several conjectures about this. All right, so now let's talk about uh, rigidity. So now we know what a local system is. And so yeah, this is the, the plan I'm, I'm gonna take a representation theoretic point of view first and define what a rigid local system is in terms of uh, representation theory. And then uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a couple of examples. And after that, shift to understanding the basic properties of uh, rigid local systems. So let uh, G be a finitely presented group. So for instance, this could be the fundamental group of a space. It could be the fundamental group of an algebraic variety. So in particular, this means that here gamma one to gamma m are some loops on your space uh, that generate the fundamental group and R1 to Rs would be relations. So those would be words in those loops uh, that happen to be contractible. So now our representation row of uh, such an abstract group G is simply given by a collection of complex matrices satisfying the relations Ri. So if you want the space of representations itself, is a sort of algebraic varieties because these relations define themselves polynomial equations that have to be satisfied by the coefficients of these uh, matrices gamma i. And yeah, two representations are said to be isomorphic or conjugate if there exists a single matrix A such that row one of G is equal to the A conjugate of row two of G. So this has to be true for all the elements G in uh, uppercase G. And so given such a representation, uh, assuming that it's irreducible, so there's no subspace, non-trivial subspace fixed by G, we say that rho is rigid if every sufficiently close representation rho prime happens to be isomorphic to rho. So this means, and yeah, to be as explicit as possible, there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that if for all the generators, the distance of rho prime of gamma i and uh, rho of gamma i is less than epsilon, then rho is actually isomorphic to rho prime. 
So this means a rigid representation cannot be continuously deformed to a non-isomorphic representation by definition. And it actually also implies that the space of all representations of this given rank n contains a connected component such that all points in this connected components are isomorphic to rho. And so one slogan that I want to advertise is that uh, rigid representations are somehow canonical representations of this group G in the sense that if you can only approximately remember the formula describing the representation, this should still be enough to recover it because there are no other representations nearby. So if you just approximately know what the matrices are, you should be able to figure out what the actual representation was. And so now if you specialize all of this to the case of a fundamental group of a smooth projective variety, we finally arrive at the definition of a rigid local system on X. So it's simply a rigid representation of its fundamental group. In the case of a smooth variety, which isn't projective, uh, one has to be slightly careful because usually um, it's much, you know, much rarer to find representations of the fundamental group of an open variety uh, that is rigid. And so what one does is one, one fixes the monotomy at infinity to, to rectify this problem. So in other words, we're choosing a nice compactification X bar, which is projective, and then uh, look at loops around the boundary components at infinity. And we fix the conjugacy classes of uh, the matrix associated to these loops. So in a concrete example, so this space here, uh, the famous uh, pair of pants is equivalent to a two sphere minus three points. And so here you can see, so the compactification in this case would be a two sphere, which is of course the Riemann sphere, so it's CP1. So here you can see the loops at infinity. And so when studying uh, rigid local systems on this space, we only consider representations with the same monotomy at infinity. So the monotomy infinity would be conjugate to the one of row. And then we look at uh, representations that cannot be continuously deformed to another one with this condition imposed. And so this is really a classical pro uh, problem. So, so the first thing one should mention is this book by uh, Nicholas Katz uh, called Rigid Local Systems, which is precisely, uh, precisely devoted to this case. So two spheres minus finitely many points. Katz obtains a complete classification by an algorithmic procedure involving uh, an operation that he calls middle convolution and the theory of power sheaves. And recently, a more elementary perspective uh, has been obtained, actually, which is purely based on, on group theory and linear algebra. So this is due to, to Feldklein. But yeah, Katz's uh, proof uh, remains highly influential, though. And one interesting aspect of the theory here, when you look at rigid local systems on, on two spheres minus finitely many points, then actually what happens is that it's not just the case that you cannot continuously deform them they actually happen to be the only representation with these given conjugacy classes at infinity. So Katz calls this property uh, physical rigidity. So there are just no other representations around with the same conjugacy classes at infinity. So this is really unique uh, to this case. So the corresponding moduli spaces just happen to consist of a, of a single point. And all of the conjectures I'm going to mention uh, later on actually known in this case, and uh, thanks to the work of, of Katz. And so the last thing I wanna say uh, concerning this example is, or these examples, it's a very rich theory by itself. And actually it really um, leads back all the way to, to, the, to the classics in mathematics. So it's related to hypergeometric differential equations in particular also to, to work on Riemann and Riemann Poch and Poch. So these rigid local systems on Q1, Q1, the study that is the RAM reverse is by the Another important example that is provided by the Shibuva varieties. Um, so I won't be able to say a lot about what a Shibuva variety is. Uh, but there are certain other big varieties ubiquitous in arithmetic uh, geometry, for instance, the Langlands program, but not limited to it. And they can be associated to um, an Achran simple matrix group G with additional data. And the fundamental group of X, and so this is the, the crucial thing for this talk, 
happens to be a certain model of subgroup of G. So a certain arithmetic graph of subgroup gamma of G. And so now it's uh, a purely representation theoretic statement known as Magulli's superrigidity, that if the rank of uh, this group G is sufficiently big, then every local system on X, meaning every gamma representation, actually comes from a regular G representation. So it actually extends to, to an algebraic representation of this matrix group G. And so this theorem implies that local systems on X, all of them, are always rigid, even without fixing monodromy infinity. So this is really quite a strong uh, rigidity statement. Sorry, what so is regular? What is regular? Sorry, I, I can't hear that. What is regular? Uh, regular algebraic. Representation. Uh, algebraic, like I'm thinking of G as a linear algebraic group. Yeah, I, yeah the, the word regular is maybe a bit ambiguous here. But here, the, the point is really it's, it's an algebraic uh, representation of G because it's a, it's a matrix group. Then another example, so, yeah. Um, do you have any further questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, these examples are maybe somehow uh, complicated. So let's look at something easier. Um, so here's a purely group theoretic example which cannot directly prom be promoted to, uh, to geometry. So this one is due to Lubotsky and uh, Maggot. And the group is constructed as a semi-direct product. So the first step is to consider the natural action of the symmetric group in three letters on a three-dimensional, on a rank three, three abelian group, set three. So this is just the action that permutes the, the components, right? And then he quotient by the diagonal uh, subgroup so set inside of set three. And so this gives you a nice action of S3 on set two. This action actually happens to be, to be irreducible, uh, particularly after, after, after you complexify it. This gives you a nice complex representation of S3, uh, which is uh, irreducible, which we're going to denote by row. So Lubatsky and Maggot, uh, they considered the semi-direct product of this rank two lattice with uh, S3. So this is the group. And then they look at the following representation. So first you project back to S3, and then you uh, post-compose with, with rho, with the representation rho, given essentially by the same action. And so this composite representation can be shown to be, to be rigid. And it's actually an important example uh, for us because it has this interesting feature that uh, although it's rigid, it does have a non-trivial infinitesimal deformation. So this means uh, there's a kind of a formal first order deformation where you, where you introduce some sort of Newtonian uh, infinitesimal epsilon, which uh, squares to zero. And you look at a kind of a defor deformation rho plus epsilon times rho prime. And so this, uh, so there exists one, one way of writing this down, which defines really a non-trivial infinitesimal deformation of rho, but it cannot be further extended to a non-trivial global deformation. So that's an interesting uh, feature of this example. But yeah, unfortunately, it's not the fundamental group of a smooth projective variety. And this actually was bugging us for a while because uh, Elaine and I we were quite interested in knowing whether rigid local systems on algebraic varieties could also have non-trivial uh, infinitesimal deformations. And so then in, in joint work uh, with uh, Eno and De Jong, we, we found a way uh, around this obstruction and we, we managed to construct a, a similar example in algebraic geometry. And it's, at the end of the day, it's really close to the original construction by Lubotsky and Maggot. So what you do is you, you pick your favorite elliptic curve. So remember that's a torus essentially, a complex torus. And you take its square, which can be identified with E3 quotient that's by E, which comes again with this natural action of the symmetric group in three letters. And then what you do is essentially you consider the quotient of E2 by this action. But this leads to, to all default singularities um, that you would like to avoid. So you apply a trick, which uh, uh, is possible thanks to work of, of Serre. So you take a simply connected smooth projective variety, P, with a free S3 action. And then you consider the quotient of P times E2 quotiented by S3. And so now uh, this space here happens to be a, a smooth and projective variety thanks to freeness of the action of S3 on, on the P component. And just like in the Lubotsky-Maggot example, it can be endowed with a rigid rank two local system 
which admits non-trivial infinitesimal deformations. And in fact, this works in all even ranks as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's not just a, a rank two phenomenon. This, this really works in all even ranks as well. So this leads us to this theorem, uh, which answers a question that we had posed ourselves for a while. So there are uh, rigid local systems with non-trivial infinitesimal deformations. So now let's take a look at basic properties of rigid local systems. So one of the most basic property is that for fixed rank, uh, there are at most finitely many of them. Very often there are none. So having a rigid representation is really indicating quite a special property of a space of a group. But finiteness is really crucial for, for many of the arguments. So it's probably worth it thinking a little bit about why finiteness is a reasonable property. So I've already alluded to the fact that there is a space of all rank n representations, since at the end of the day, representation simply associates a matrix to each generator of the group and then certain relations have to be satisfied. So there's this nice algebraic variety of representations. And as a matter of fact, you know, algebraic varieties only have finitely many connected components. And so rigid representation corresponds to a single connected component of this model space. And that's why there can only be finitely many rigid representations. And so this property that probably doesn't uh, sound that exciting by itself actually has some, some important consequences. In fact, um, like all the proofs about uh, rigid local, of, about some interesting property of rigid local systems uh, allude to, to finiteness at some point. And so one uh, consequence like that is the following proposition that a rigid representation of a finitely presented group is always uh, conjugate or isomorphic to a representation uh, taking values uh, in a number field. So a finite field extension K of Q. So in other words, if you look at the, the traces of your representation, they will always be algebraic numbers. So this is the case for rigid representations. And I mean, there are many ways to prove this. Um, this is one argument that I like. So you consider this horrible group of all, of all uh, field automorphisms of the complex numbers out of C. And given such a field automorphism and given another representation rho of G, we can construct a new representation sigma of rho simply by applying the field automorphism to the matrices in your representation. This action, despite of the fact that it's highly not continuous with respect to the standard topology, happens to uh, preserve rigidity since it is Zariski continuous. So it's continuous with respect to the natural topology that we use in algebraic topology, uh, in algebraic geometry, excuse me. So the topology where closed subspaces are just uh, closed sub varieties. So they are defined for polynomials. And so it's again uh, an interesting fact that connected components with respect to the standard topology agree with connected components defined with respect to the Tsarisky topology. So that's why this action preserves rigidity. And since there are only finitely many of them, this implies that every isomorphism class of a rigid representation leads to a finite orbit with respect to this class, with respect to this action. And finiteness of this orbit uh, quickly implies that, for instance, all of the traces of your representation also have a finite orbit, and thus they are algebraic numbers. Because if they were transcendental, then it's quite easy to just, you know, produce orbits which are infinite. And thus, every rigid local system can be defined over a number field. Um, they have another interesting property, uh, which is that they carry complex variations of hot structures. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip this slide because it's a bit lengthy, but please ask me about it at the end of the talk in case you're interested. So now let's talk about uh, Simpson's uh, motivicity and integrality conjecture. So a local system on an algebraic variety is said to be of geometric origin if generically, and so this means over some sufficiently big open subvariety, the local system is given by something which is motivic. So motivic means it comes from algebraic geometry. And so to be precise, this means that over this open subset U, there exists a smooth and projective family of varieties such that the original local system rho, uh, rho restricted to U is a direct summand of the variation of cohomology of the federation. So in other words, local systems of geometric origin really come from the variation of cohomology of smooth and projective varieties 
possibly over some some open dense sub variety of x. So I think they're, they're aptly, aptly known. So maybe they should be called algebra of geometric origin. But yeah, just to be brief. And so this condition of being of geometric origin uh, has some important consequences. We're going to see some of them uh, later on. But one of the most famous one is uh, quasi-unipotence of the monotomy at infinity. So let me recall that a matrix is called quasi-unipotent if a suitable power of it is unipotent. So all the eigenvalues will be uh, roots of unities. And if you take an open algebraic variety and a local system of geometric origin, then for every loop around the boundary component, so just like here in the case of CP1 minus finitely many points, for every loop around the boundary component, the associated matrix will be quasi-unipotent. So this is known as the monotomy theorem. And it kind of restricts uh, the monotomies at infinity that can arise when looking at uh, local systems of geometric origin. And so this is a uh, meter that is uh, one of the main hypotheses in this conjecture due to uh, Carlos Simpson, uh, the motivicity conjecture. So Simpson conjectured that a rigid local system on a possibly open variety with fixed quasi unipotent monotomy at infinity uh, should be of geometric origin. So here I included the definition again. So this means that there is some family defined over some open dense sub variety, which is a family, you know, purely algebraically defined of smooth and projective varieties, such that the original local system sits inside of the variation of homology of this variation. And yes, yeah, so this assumption of having quasi uniform monotomy at infinity needs to be imposed by the virtual monotomy identified as monotomy theorem. Otherwise, it's a wide leads to certain, certain implications, some of which are, are in certain cases checkable. So one direct implication being um, integrality. So the variation of cohomology of the vibration is always defined over the integers. That's something we've seen essentially on the very first slides because cohomology itself is an integral theory. So the cohomology groups are abelian groups. So the variation of cohomology will be a local system which is itself integral in a suitable sense. So given by a representation taking values in GLN of the integers. So now if you take a direct sub, if you take a direct summand of such a representation, this direct summand might not be defined over the integers, but it will always be defined over the ring of integers of a number field K. So it still has a certain integrality property. Okay. And so in particular, Simpson's conjecture implies that rigid local systems with a fixed quasi unipotent monogamy at infinity should be isomorphic to GLOK value representations. So they should be integral. So this is really something that can be, can be answered in, in certain cases. So in fact, this concerns a uh, work of uh, Elaine and myself. Um, where we proved the integrality uh, conjecture for so-called cohomologically rigid local systems. So here I'm just quickly going to uh, tell you the plan. So I want to first uh, state the, our result, and then sketch the main steps uh, of the proof, and then mention a recent generalization by, by Kleftal and Patrikis. And so this part is now really um, solidly anchored in arithmetic geometry. I will not be able to precisely explain all of the terms that show up here. So it's a bit of a, a disclaimer. Um, and then to, towards the end, I also want to uh, mention some other work uh, that Elaine and I have on so-called uh, Frobenius crystal structures that can be produced uh, for rigid local systems. Right, so this is uh, one of our theorems. So um, Simpson's integrality conjecture holds for cohomologically rigid local systems. And so those are precisely local systems which don't have any infinitesimal deformations. And again, as always, it will be necessary to fix the quasi-unipotent monotomy at infinity, unless you're working with uh, projective algebraic varieties. So let me quickly say what we, what we mean here. Um, so infinitesimal deformations are really just given by something very concrete. So you're looking at representations over the ring of dual numbers. So working with uh, those Newtonian infinitesimals, epsilon squaring to zero, 
And so this formal derivative rho prime uh, doesn't itself satisfy the axiom of a representation, but it satisfies the axioms of a, of a group co-cycle, an element of H1. So this uh, derivative rho prime gives rise to a non-trivial element of H1 of X, or could be also the group uh, with coefficients in the dual of rho tensor with rho. So that's the endomorphism representation of rho. And so this formula would be slightly different in the open case. So in order to account for the monotony at infinity, one has to replace this by the IC complex associated to this local system. But in the projective situation, it's precisely H1 of X with this uh, coefficient uh, local system, rho dual tensor rho. And so thus, cohomological rigidity is really equivalent to uh, the vanishing of this cohomology group. So it's really a cohomological condition, hence, hence the name. And it's a cohomological condition which implies rigidity. So if you don't have any infinitesimal deformations, you also don't have any global deformations. But as we've seen uh, in the example by Lubotsky and Maggot, and the one uh, jointly constructed with uh, Elaine and uh, Yu and the Young, um, this is not true in the other direction. So rigidity doesn't imply cohomological rigidity. And if you're familiar with the, the theory of schemes, then uh, a counterexample, for instance, would be an isolated point of the modelized space of representations which is a fat point of the, the modelized scheme. So it has some infinitesimal deformations. Right, and so the idea for the proof of this theorem is to use uh, some of the, the powerful methods provided by, by arithmetic geometry, in particular uh, over finite fields. So the, the Langlands program, for instance, is going to, to enter the picture at some point. And the first step will be to replace representations of topological fundamental groups by representations of uh, the Ital fundamental group, which was defined by, by the Grotendieck school. So this is really quite a versatile object, uh, which can be introduced not just for algebraic varieties, but for all kinds of schemes, so in particular also for, for commutative rings. And this will be very useful. It's a very useful fact and very, very relevant fact because it's, it provides a sort of bridge from the complex numbers to finite fields. And over the finite fields, we can then use results on the Langlands program and so on. And this will be, you know, this will enter the proof indirectly. So in order to uh, get to the Ital fundamental group, uh, what we're going to use is that for a complex variety, the profinite completion of the topological fundamental group happens to be isomorphic to the Ital fundamental group. So that's one of the you know, first big theorems that was established by, by the Grotendieck school on the Ital fundamental group, kind of you know, to demonstrate how, how close the resulting theory was to the topological theory, the resulting theory of Ital fundamental groups, which was defined in purely algebraic terms. And so now we can use the universal property of the profinite completion. So recall that a profinite group is simply an inverse limit of finite groups. And so now if you give me any group homomorphism from a group G to a profinite group P, then the universal property tells me that there's a unique continuous group homomorphism from the profinite completion G hat to P. Because these profinite groups, they're not just abstract groups, they actually come with a topology. They actually happen to be compact. And so this compactness actually also plays a particular role uh, in order to establish uh, the integrality conjecture. So you see, in order to apply uh, this universal property, the first step will be to replace complex representations by representations taking values in a uh, profinite group. And this is precisely what we're doing here. And so one uh, profinite group uh, that is lurking around here is given by uh, the Eladic integers, actually by GLN of the Eladic integers. And so for a prime number L, the more conventional choice of P uh, for as notation will appear later in the next slide. So for a prime number L, we define a profinite ring of Eladic integers as the following uh, inverse limit. So we just look at uh, the reductions of the integers by all possible L powers, which can be arranged in a very nice uh, inverse limit. And so this is a, a profinite ring. In particular, GLN of this profinite ring will be, will be a profinite group. And there's this amazing uh, property that although um, the l integers are built uh, from you know, characteristic L data, 
uh, they give rise to a characteristic zero object just by localizing. So if you localize this ring in L, or if you look at the fraction field, then you obtain a characteristic zero uh, field, uh, QL. And just for abstract reasons, uh, you take the algebraic closure and you obtain a field which is abstractly isomorphic to the complex numbers. And so this is our way in. This is our way to the Atal fundamental group. So we can just use such an isomorphism, no matter how um, absurd it seems to identify a nice field like the complex numbers with something slightly more complicated like QL bar, but this is going to be our way in. And it so happens uh, that one can show using a theorem by, uh, by Castle that for fixing a rank for a fixed rank N and a fixed X, there will be infinitely many primes L such that every rigid local system rho on X factors through this profile X subgroup GLN of set L contained inside of GLN of QL bar, which we identify with GLN of C. So this might sound a bit surprising, but actually the, the proof is very, very simple. It's very elementary. But so now we can apply this uh, universal property of profile completions to obtain a continuous representation of the Etal uh, fundamental group. But it's just, it's a, it's a comment from a, a French mathematicians who would prefer to stay anonymous. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> A lot of people are shocked by identifications of uh, complex numbers by, <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so as I said, um, the Etal fundamental group is quite a, a versatile object because the theory is in place, not just for algebraic varieties of spaces, but also for more general uh, commutative rings and schemes. In particular, we can now go to a characteristic P. And there's a very a concrete path to characteristic P provided by the specialization map relating the fundamental group of a complex variety with the tal fundamental group of its mod P reductions. And so this is again, uh, something that was given to us by, by the Grotenleek school. And it's, it's not so difficult to see that if you choose P big enough, so this is the concrete bound, then these continuous set L linear representations that we've associated to rigid local systems on the previous slide will descend along the specialization map. They will factor through the specialization map. And so now uh, we see that to every rigid local system of this fixed rank N, we can associate a continuous representation of the tal fundamental group of a variety defined over FP bar. So of an algebraically closed field of characteristic P. So now we're almost where we want to be. There's one further step. Uh, which is using a lemma, which was actually already observed by, by Simpson in a slightly <clears throat> different uh, context. So Simpson observed that if you have a rigid local system on a variety defined over some algebraic closure, you can actually always descend it to the variety defined over a finite extension of the original base field. In this case, we get all the way to a variety defined over a finite field FQ. So now we are where we want to be. Now we are in the, the realm of, of arithmetic geometry. And so this is um, the precise uh, package of results that we're using. So continuous uh, local systems, so sorry, local systems in positive characteristic. And so this means continuous representations of itself and mental groups, they can be classified despite of the abstract uh, nature can be classified by something very concrete, namely by a function, a sort of a, a trace function. And this function is simply, you know, taking a, a field valued point, an FQ valued point of your variety defined over a finite field and associating to it a number. So in this case, an element of QL bar. And in fact, um, I can even tell you how, this, uh, how the definition works. So every FQ point of my variety gives rise to a sort of loop in, in pi one of x. So this might sound contradictory that points give rise to, to elements of the fundamental group, but that's because I'm working with a field that isn't algebraically closed. And so the fundamental group, the Etal fundamental group of the spectrum of a field can be identified with the Galois group of the field, which in this case is topologically generated by a single element known as the Frobenius. And so now what this function f does is it takes a representation and computes the traces like these Frobenius elements, which will be well defined. And so that's how we introduce the function. So now uh, oh, using the thoughts of the group of the Langlands diagram of the ELN, ELN, the final real seals, and all the drawing volume here on the stone is the impediment correspondence. 
without allows us to so go back and forth between QNR local systems and QNQL prime bar local systems and the LNL prime are distinct primers. So Trinkle showed that there exists a bijection between uh, isomorphism classes of a reducible continuous QL bar and QL prime bar linear representations respecting this function. So for every choice of isomorphism, the function will be kind of transformed by, by sigma. And so using, using this property, uh, one can show, so this is what uh, Elena and I did, one can show that the companion correspondence actually preserves uh, the property of being cohomologically rigid. One important feature of these continuous representations of Vital fundamental groups is that they are automorphically, that they are automatically integral. So they always you know, factor through some compact subgroup just by compactness of profile groups themselves. And so this is how we obtain integrality for all primes. So starting with uh, knowing integrality for very large prime, we apply the companion uh, correspondence and then obtain uh, integrality for the small primes that usually are troublemakers as well. So yeah, this is roughly how the argument works. So yeah, I wanna mention that this was recently uh, generalized by uh, Kleftal and Patrikis. Uh, so where they work uh, not just with representations, but actually uh, chi local systems. So they consider homomorphisms from the fundamental group to uh, a semi-simple group chi and uh, prove a, an integrality property for, for such rigid chi local systems. Again, assuming quite an important monotomy at infinity. All right, and so then, if it's okay for me to go over by five minutes, I think I'll manage to go through my slides. Would that, would that be fine? So now let me just quickly mention another uh, result that we have, another set of results really. So <clears throat> integrality is one interesting testing ground for uh, the motivicity conjecture. But if you believe in, in the motivicity conjecture, then more should be true actually. And so the reason is that uh, for all mod p reductions, you should be able to associate to a rigid local system all possible kinds of incarnations because uh, for varieties defined over characteristic p, we have various cohomology theories like elladic cohomology coming with their own uh, package of uh, local systems. And then there's also crystalline cohomology, which corresponds to uh, so-called f isocrystals. And so if you believe in Simpson motivicity conjecture, then it should be possible to associate such an f a crystal to every rigid local system. At least the uh, form of people reductions by p is sufficiently big. And so I won't have the time to, I mean, I think no talk would be long enough to properly explain what an f a crystal is, unfortunately. But just to give you the gist of it, so locally it's given by a sort of a formal flag connection defined on local lifts of your variety in characteristic p to characteristic zero. And then there's an interesting compatibility condition with lifts of the Frobenius uh, that needs to be satisfied by, uh, by the connection. So that's roughly what an f crystal is. But as I said, uh, this would require maybe one or two talks of its own. But so one of our results, um, which has also led to some interesting applications is that uh, for rigid local systems, we can show that for sufficiently big P, mod p reductions uh, carry associated f isocrystals. And in fact, um, even stronger, these f isocrystals come from what uh, is known as a fontaine le Fay module. And so I won't even start explaining what the fontaine le Fay module is, but it, it leads uh, to an interesting property of the original Betty local systems, which is known as uh, being uh, crystalline. And so this actually turned out to be useful in the recent proof of uh, the andre conjecture by um, Gila, uh, Shankar, and Zimmermann. So this is uh, the last thing I want to mention. So I want to quickly talk about uh, applications of our result. Uh, so the original work on uh, the integrality conjecture was applied amongst many other things, of course, uh, by uh, Lenzmann and Litt in recent work on canonical representations of uh, surface groups. So yeah, uh, Daniel Litt is uh, one of my colleagues from, from Toronto. And so in their work, uh, Lentzman and Litt consider representations of the fundamental group of a genus G surface, uh, which is essentially fixed by a finite index subgroup of the mapping class group. 
So the mapping class group is really just uh, up to, you know, the extended mapping class group is really just the group of all outer automorphisms of the fundamental group. And so the, the group of outer automorphisms acts on isomorphism classes of representations. And so now a representation is called canonical if it has finite uh, orbit with respect to this action. So Lenzman and Litt could prove that canonical representations of sufficiently small rank are actually always uh, finite. And so the proof is based on two things. So first of all, the first bound, the image of the representation to show that it's contained in the unitary group. So this uses a previous result on isomononomic uh, deformations. And then uh, they establish um, integrality by showing that uh, given such a canonical representation, you can produce a uh, local system which is cohomologically rigid on the finite cover of the universal curve. So the universal curve of the modelized space of all curves. So putting these two things together, you obtain finiteness of monotony. So then the other thing, the other application that I want to mention is uh, this aforementioned uh, results by Pilar Shankar and Zimmermann on André Alt. So this slide we've already seen is just recalling what the Shimura variety is in very broad strokes. And um, so Shimura varieties, um, as I said, are very complicated objects. Some of them, certain examples are related to modelized spaces of elliptic curves or abelian varieties. And from there, it's known that you have these uh, collections of special points and special sub varieties. For instance, special points would correspond to elliptic curves with complex multiplication or abelian varieties of CM types. So things that are really arithmetically highly significant. And so this conjecture due to André Orta states that every irreducible component of the Tsarisky closure of a set of special points is a special sub variety. And so this was established by uh, Pila Shankar and Zimmermann in recent work using precisely uh, the second result of uh, Elaine and myself, namely this uh, fontaine la Faye property. So the crystallinity property of representations, of rigid representations. So in their proof, they have uh, to construct a canonical height function, which they do by building a certain well-behaved norm on a vector bundle stemming from a rigid local system. And at each place, they construct the norm uh, locally, so locally at the prime P using P adequate theory. And in order to glue all of this together, they require this uh, crystallinity property, which uh, follows from, from our work. And so here it's really crucial that on Shimura varieties of sufficiently high rank, everything is rigid and in fact, even cohomologically rigid. Thanks, Simon, for the next talk. So question for the others. I didn't see the fiber of your your of the base X, the, the variety that was being Um Do uh, you mean in the diagram that I showed, or no? Well, in the in the uh, in your rigidity result, right? I, I mean, there's supposed to be some. So we we don't prove motivicity, right? So we're still far away from from that. Ah, I see. So it's it's really like the the first result that I talked about that concerns integrality of the monotomy, and then the other result, uh, you know, shows that we can associate these other uh, exotic uh, local systems. But is, yeah. there, is, is there any conjectural way of sort of- So, of yeah. From thin air, the, the... No, I mean, only in, in kind of, you know, if it's like in rank two, you can kind of, you know, cook up a family of abelian varieties. So you have that, um, but in the higher rank case, yeah, it's, it's very tricky. So in, so like, as I said, in the case of P1 minus finitely many points, you have to work off cuts. And there you can really produce the, the family. Yeah. So like using cuts as classification, essentially everything is known about rigid local systems that one would like to know. Um, but so at the moment, I mean, somehow the idea is that, so if rigid local systems are really motivic, then these motifs kind of cast different shadows. So one shadow being, you know, the integrality property. And so this is something we now understand a little bit better. And then the other shadow is that in characteristic P, you have all these, other notions of local systems that one can associate to a family of varieties. And so those we can construct too. So essentially we kind of, you know, we, we start seeing all these shadows that we can actually sort of provide us with some confirmation, but getting to motivicity itself, I mean, yeah, that's still a very, very tricky problem. Yeah. There's one in this, uh, the isocrystal statement, what do you expect for small ranks? Uh, expect in, in the sense. Um, uh, I mean, you get Fontaine the five modules, assuming things are pretty large. Would you expect for small primes? Oh, okay. What do we expect for small primes? Like yeah. Prismatic object, or would you would be more semi stable versions of these? Um, so the Duran property should be should be Duran representations yeah. for very small primes. They should be Duran. Yeah. 
just because that's the kind of you know ramification or reduction that you that you expect coming from motivity. Um, I would at the same prime where you have the the crystallinity property. I no actually Lin I should say expects that you get a prismatic F uh, crystals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you can associate to them because they induce uh, crystalline uh, yeah. local systems. So this is kind of the, and that, that would be a natural guess to yeah to continue in this direction. <laughs> so I don't know if I if I can back go back to the FISO crystal exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so concerning the prime P, so in the original uh, paper we don't give an explicit bound on P, but this problem was actually resolved recently in in unpublished work by De Jong and Eno. So you can look at. Uh, uh, Elin's uh, lecture notes of the Einberg lectures on her on her website. So there they showed that whenever the connection itself is unramified, uh, then this statement is true. So it's really really interesting. I was wondering if your methods um, in the cohomologically rigid case somehow be extended to the general rigid case using the using the Libra and all the um, Yeah, um, this is definitely something we've we've looked at. Um, so the problem is that, so the companion correspondence interacts very nicely with numerical aspects of cohomology. So it's very easy to compare different Betty numbers or Frobenius traces and so on. But we don't know how to, you know, get our hands on the group structure, like the, sorry, the, the ring structure, the cup product structure, so like the Lee bracket that you mentioned. And, you know, given that the companion correspondence is defined in terms of traces, it's not clear just for purely philosophical reasons if it should be possible. Yeah. But one one would hope so, but it's yeah, with the current moment methods that we have, we, we don't think we can do it. <laughs>